All right, bowling off this Tuesday edition of the Sportsman Zone with cricket. The final four for the CG United Super 50 Cup have been decided with the close of the preliminary stage at the weekend. Trinidad and Tobago Red Force, Leeward Islands Hurricanes, Barbados Pride and Guyana Harpy Eagles have all booked their spots and will vie for places in the final. The Red Force beat Barbados Pride in Sunday's final preliminary game to finish top of the group with 49 points and causing the Pride to slip to third place on 37. Leeward Islands Hurricanes finished second with 44 points while the Harpy Eagles were fourth with 34 points. So the semi-final matchups will see TNT Red Force against the Guyana Harpy Eagles on Wednesday while on Thursday Barbados Pride battle the Hurricanes. Both matches will be at the Brian Lara Cricket Academy. Nikhil Utam Chandani, who has been on commentary during the Super 50 Cup, joins us to discuss the competition. Um, Nikhil, it's a pleasure to have you back on the Sportsman Zone. I gather you've been having quite a lot of fun in Trinidad and Tobago, both on and off the field or in and out of the commentary box. <laughs> Yeah, mainly uh, in the commentary box, you know. Well, let's yeah, leave, let's leave it there, shall leave. we? <laughs> let's leave it there and talk about some cricket, Nikhil, because it seems as if you have been stumped. So um, let's give you a, a, another chance. This is now the second innings. Um, Nikhil, assess the preliminary stage of this um, Super 50 Cup for us, shall you? Yeah, I think it's been really interesting um, with the innovation of the bonus point system this season to address specific targets and areas where West Indies cricket can improve. Um, I do think I, I credit West Indies cricket and Miles Bascom and his team for the innovation, Darren Sammy and those who have been behind it, because I think it was no point just coming into the tournament, um, just doing the same things over and over again. We're not in the World Cup. We won't be in the next Champions Trophy. Um, and it's about now building towards that 2027 World Cup in, in four years' time. It was a really great opportunity to have a look at the two youngest teams who, for me, were massively impressive in the West Indies Academy, who I thought were in the best four teams in this tournament and deserve to be in the semifinal, and the combined campuses and colleges who fought well and have shown glimpses of some really exciting talent to come uh, in the future. So, all in all, I think the group stages have been really good, and I think it's hard to predict who will come out of these two semifinals and go on to win the tournament, because obviously Trinidad start as the favourite, but we know the nature of not only this tournament, but the way that the 50-over game can go, as we saw today with Glenn Maxwell, anything is possible. Yeah, talk to me about the bonus point system and how you think it would have impacted or affected the batting performances in this tournament and whether you have seen any improvements on the part of the batsmen. Yeah, definitely, Ricardo. I think I have seen improvements. I've looked closely in a couple of areas where West Indies cricket has fallen behind and won the internationals. And that's obviously in the middle overs. It's no secret that we've struggled. You look at the numbers... Since the 2019 World Cup, the West Indies have been the 12th best team in the world in terms of the run rate in that period, and that's below five runs and over. So I looked closely at that phase, and it was really refreshing to see the two youngest teams in the tournament be the only teams above five and over. But it just goes to show that while there's still a lot of room for improvement, and yes, the Super 50 bowling won't be the same you get at the international level, there is that added impetus you know, in the middle overs. Another area where I think it has benefited our batting is the first 10 overs, where last season everyone was struggling to get over five runs per over. This year, five teams have been able to do that in the group stages. So there was definitely that added intent um, and more, I think, aggressive stroke play, uh, fearless cricket, which is needed in that power play. And it's what the best teams in the world, you look at this World Cup, India, South Africa, they're getting 60 and 70 for one in that first 10 over. So in those two aspects especially, I think I've seen the most improvement. Yeah, Nikhil, you know, a concern for, I think, all lovers of West Indies cricket over time has been the ability of our batsmen to play spin. And when you look at the numbers from this tournament, I'm not sure if it is because of the pitch conditions, but nine of the top ten wicket takers in this tournament so far are spinners. Is that concerning? I think it is slightly concerning. And obviously the surfaces in Trinidad and Tobago will naturally suit the spinners. And they've been very conducive. Um, we've had the opportunity to cover the games at the Brian Lara Cricket Academy. But the games at the UE campus um, have definitely been very 
it's conducive for the spinner. So spin have wreaked havoc at that ground especially. But I would say it is an area that still probably requires further improvement. And I know coaches and Darren Sami continues to highlight that as being a major issue. But I definitely think it's good practice for the region that we're on these slower surfaces that are spinning so much. Um, because, it, as you said, it is a massive area of improvement. And I don't think we fully executed in the way that we ought to if we want to compete with the best teams in the world. In that India series, it was a massive struggle when Jadeja, Kuldeep Yadav and others came. And I think England, knowing them and knowing what they're going through now in the World Cup, they will come down with a fair complement of spinners as well for that next series in December. So it's going to be up to Shea Hope, Athenaeus, Casey Carty and guys like that to really withstand that spin. And we'll get to see if it's made a difference this tournament that is in that series in a couple of weeks' time. Yes, and sticking with the bowling, Sunil Narayan, one of the top wicket takers for the Super 50 so far, alongside Hayden Walls Jr. and, of course, Yannick Carrier. I didn't get your take because we didn't chat since about Sunil Narayan and the fact that he's made it official that he's stepping down from international cricket and 50 over. A comment on, you know, what you saw from him so far up close and, of course, him stepping away. Well, I think the world knows that Sunil Narayan, in whatever cricket, it's been so hard over the years to actually score against this man. You look just a couple of days ago in that game against Barbados. I think it was 10 overs for 18 runs and obviously got the wickets as well, the four foot. It's just amazing how, you know, with all of the advent of technology over the years, you hear teams doing planning and you hear bowlers saying, well, the first season, you know, you get a lot of wickets. The next year, it's always harder. Some way, somehow, Sunil Narayan has been able to fight that and has always been able to just be so deceptive with his bowling. At times, it's been in a much more economical role in the IPLs and in international cricket. But you look at a tournament like the Super 50, where he's right at the top of the list for wickets of all time, he has just been so hard to play, so hard to score against. And I think he's a huge reason why the Trinidad and Tobago Red Force are still unbeaten this season. So he will be a huge miss. And just to piggyback on what you said about Walsh and Carrier, I think it's really great to see, Mariah, the competition for places. Um, obviously, Carrier is the resident leg spin in the West Indies white ball team. He's been there for the last couple of series. But it's fantastic to see Hayden Walsh, who I think has been so impressive. I may even give him the edge over Carrier in this tournament. Just the way he's bowled, I think the pace that he's bowled at has been very different to what he's done in the past. I know personally he's put in a lot of work. And I think if we can get those two guys firing, both are very capable with bat in hand and in the field, it's only good and great for the future of West Indies cricket. Yeah, I'm also really happy for Hayden Walls Jr. because we know how much work he's been putting in. You know, I even had him on in case you missed it, and I was asking him if he was transitioning into golf. But he was like, no, have no fear. He's been doing the work to ensure that, you know, he does what he has to do. A comment, though, on Darren Bravo, his captaincy, and his performance, because he's been leading by example. Yeah, I think he's always led admirably well on the field in terms of the decision making. And look, when you have that bowling lineup in these conditions, I don't think... Um, it's the biggest challenge to lead that team. And you have guys like Narayan. I mean, he said it. Aki Hossein, who's a West Indies left arm spinner. And then, obviously, the West Indies talent that he's had in his batting lineup. But you can't take anything away from the way he's led with batting hand. That 100 was a game with a lot on the line uh, against the Barbados Pride. They wanted to finish top of the table because you get an added incentive um, this year. In terms of monetary, you also get the number one seed. And if rain falls, you go straight on to that final so there was a lot at stake. And the way he commanded the innings, but also minimized risk until the very last minute. And then just showed in the last three overs how skillful he is at hitting maximums. That, to me, was a tremendous innings and showed real character from him, knowing the responsibility he has as captain. And the fact that he couldn't really be dismissed in that last 10 overs because they could have ended up, instead of posting 290, posting just 250 or 240, which could have easily been chased. So... I think, look, he's always shown um, that he's capable of being consistent with bat in hand, but it was his first 118 listed innings, and he'll want um, that he can hope, he'll, sorry, he'll hope that he can finish the tournament with a couple more centuries, or even if it's one more, to really knock on the door of selection going into the next couple of series in England and Australia. Yes, and Nikhil, I can't understand and I can't figure out why Jamaica has been so poor this season. Seven matches, no wins, seven points. Again, you're close to the action. Maybe you'll have an answer. 
I wish uh, we heard from Ricardo first, you know, Maria, but we will, I'm sure, hear from him. I think it's really interesting and one that we couldn't really figure out, to be honest, because this is defending champions and you look at the personnel. In fact, some would argue they may have even got stronger. Fabian Allen wasn't in the squad last season. He was there this year. But what it did show was the importance of Brandon King, who got over 300 runs last year and I think papered over a lot of the cracks of that middle order when he got, off, got them off to flying starts a season ago. So the biggest concern would be obviously the way that they batted spin in the tournament. Um, I think it was four or five spinners took four and five wicket hauls against them. And obviously it's never going to be easy when you lose wickets in clusters. Captain Robin Paul was very honest um, to his credit and said, you know, they have to look, have a hard look at, him, at, them, at themselves after this tournament. But even himself, who's the West Indies vice captain and obviously in a leadership position in the T20 internationals, uh, he implemented how important it is for him to just get back into to the runs with international cricket right around the corner. But obviously the bowling as well. Dennis Bulai and Javor Royal, who took more than 10 wickets last year, were instrumental for them. And this season, you know, took below five, both of them. So that was big losses as well. But I think the biggest thing to me was the way that they played spin and they just weren't able to do it consistently enough. And that's why they were unable to win a game. Yeah, a good segue. And just referencing the point that Ricardo had made earlier on about um, the spinners dominating the statistics. Um, a quick comment on the leeward spinner, Daniel Doram. He's uh, like six, 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 seven. The last left arm spinner that toe we saw in the Caribbean would have been Suleiman Ben. And we have a proliferation of left arm spinners at the moment in the Caribbean. Gurukesh Mota, Virasamit Permal, Karapir, Akil Hussain, and so on. How good is, is, is Daniel Doram and um, his height and the way he gets the ball to bounce and turn? To be honest, Lance, he's very different uh, to Moti and Hossein, who have been the two left arm spinners that have been around the team for the last four or five years. What Durham does well, as you mentioned, that bounce. And on these surfaces here, there's been variable bounce. So guys like him, Ross and Chase, who's slightly shorter, have extracted a lot of good results, especially at the Brian Lara Cricket Academy, where Durham got the seventh foot against Jamaica. It's been impressive. However, I think before he's thrown into the deep end, and it's not going to be easy either, because Gurukesh Moti every season in list day cricket and international cricket has shown that it's going to take something to remove him from that leading spinner role in the West Indies team. He did well in the India series. And he, bat, he bats a to bit take... too. Yeah, he's got a first class 100 as well. That's right. And he showed for Guyana in CPL and this tournament that he's capable of powering things in the, middle, in the last 10 or so. So it's not going to be easy for Durham. But as I said with Carrier and Walsh, competition for places is fantastic. And if you have someone like Durham, Yes, he's done well this one season, but if he can go in the four-day tournament where he was with them the last two years, do well there, then maybe even in next year's Super 50 or if he gets a CPL call-up. If these guys can consistently put out performances regionally, I think it creates a better environment for West Indies cricket overall and obviously a lot more for the selectors to pick up. And then you have horses for courses in conditions where you may get more bounce. You can go to someone like Durham um, and you can play that complement of, of maybe two or three spinners depending on conditions or wherever you're touring in the world. So, Durham, I think his story has been inspirational, the way he's moved, obviously, from St. Martin to the Netherlands and now has got that real success. And it'll be exciting to see how he goes, not only in these next couple of games, if they get to the final, but in the future of his career as well, given the raw materials that he has. Yeah, Nikhil. All right, so in 10 seconds, um, I hear you're the cricket prediction guru, so um, give us your finalists, Red Force versus Harpy Eagles and Pride versus Hurricanes. Just reminding the fans and the, you guys that I got the CPL one spot on. But anyways, moving on from that, <laughs> uh, I have the Hurricanes and Red Force. Yes, no Barbados pride. I think Hurricanes with that fast bowling duo, the Red Force still undefeated. I think those two meet off in the final. And then if anything happens, I think there could be an upset. You know, I think the Hurricanes could just win it all. Mm, wow. Well, you did get the CPL right. It has given you some confidence and you're going all out with the Super 50. I hope you don't end up dismissed. We'll take a break, we'll be back with more on the Sportsmax Zone. <laughs>